The future. Ever since humanity has been on the earth, we have been fascinated by the concept of foretelling the future. If we knew the future, we could make decisions that would be in our best interest. We could avoid mistakes. We could become rich. We would be much happier. We could have a better career. And the list goes on and on. And so there's been a myriad of ways in which we have invented all sorts of methods to foretell the future. From examining the entrails of animals, to palm reading, to stargazing, we have been very creative as a society in looking at animals, in looking at ourselves, looking at the heavens, to gain any sort of insight that we can into foretelling the future. And as a, as a result of that, there's been a whole industry which has been developed around foretelling the future. From psychics who gaze into crystal balls, to tarot readers who read playing cards, to mediums who connect with spirits, and to astrologers who read the movements of stars and of the planets. This whole foretelling future business this whole industry is a billion, multi-billion dollar business worldwide. The problem, of course, with all of these different methods is that if people really could tell the future, they would be able to predict natural events, and so in the process they could save many lives. They could, as well, make their own lives incredibly prosperous and incredibly happy and so therefore they wouldn't need to offer their own business services. But instead, their foretelling is very much of a general nature. Or it could be so broad that it fits in with most people's circumstances. Or on the other hand, their foretelling could be just simply wrong. So what we'd like to show you tonight is that the Bible offers the answers to all of our anxieties about the future, whether that's on a personal level or whether that's on a global level. Whether you're worried about the everyday things in life or whether you're worried about the state of the world, the Bible offers peace of mind. It offers security and comfort. And as Bible students, we don't claim to be able to foretell the events in your own personal life nor do we claim to be able to predict the next global crisis that will engulf the world. Or, for example, what the outcome of the current um, coronavirus pandemic will be. But as, glo as, um, as Bible students, we can confidently affirm that the Bible has a wonderful hope for this earth. That God has a plan and a purpose with all of humanity. And what we'd like to show you tonight is that the wonderful future that the Bible outlines can be absolutely relied upon to be fulfilled and that you can also be a part of this wonderful time. We believe what, that what we can show you tonight is that the hope of the Bible can be your personal hope as well and that the hope of the Bible is backed up by God's ironclad guarantee that what he says will occur will actually happen. He will surely bring that to pass. And how can we be confident in that? Well, for the very reason why we would be amazed if someone would be able to accurately foretell the future. Because the Bible itself consistently proves itself to be reliable through prophecy. It's prophesied events thousands of years before they occurred, and some of them, as we'll see tonight, have been fulfilled within our modern times. What we'll also like to see tonight is that the hope of the Bible is connected to the hope of Israel. And so what we want to do is have a look at events that were prophesied in relation to the nation of Israel and show that the Bible can be absolutely relied upon because of the fulfilment of those events connected to the nation of Israel. It's really a most fascinating area of Bible prophecy, 
and it never ceases to amaze me as to how accurate the Bible is and how absolutely sure the hope of the Bible is. Well, tonight's address is about worrying about the future, and worry is a natural part of life. And particularly when the future is unknown and we feel anxious about our inability to control the future. We can agonise over the, the right decision to make. We are fearful of the ramifications and the consequences if we get that decision wrong. And our imagination can go into overdrive as we overanalyse and underassess the situation. And before we know it, we're thinking of all sorts of horror situations. Every month there is a survey that takes place. It's um, done by a company called Ipsos. It's a well-recognised survey company. It operates in Australia as well as overseas as well. And every month they ask, what worries Australians the most? And so as the title of this particular survey says, that uh, the Ipsos Issues Monitor is Australia's longest running ongoing survey of community concerns. We've checked in with 1,000 Australians' worries each and every month for more than a decade. So what are we most concerned about? How do these worries change? And which political party do we believe is most capable of addressing these issues? And what we find in this particular survey is that consistently, year on year, there are five top uh, issues which worry Australians the most. And they are the economy, healthcare, unemployment, the cost of living, and the environment. So people are worried about the economic conditions that will impact on their personal business or the company that they work in. They're worried about healthcare. They're worried about how they can receive healthcare in the right way and when they need it most. They're worried about unemployment, their own personal job security, how they're going to keep up with the living expenses, how they're going to save enough to pay off the mortgage. And they're worried about the environment as well. What's the cost of human activities on the environment? Will they or their children have a planet to live on? Now, when you look at this same Ipsos uh, survey from a global perspective, we see here that there are, again, five top issues that, on a global scale, people are worried about. And that is the coronavirus, unemployment, poverty and social inequality, financial and political corruption, and crime and violence. So these are the, the top issues which Australians and the world are worrying about the most. So whilst it's natural to slip into the type of thinking of worrying about things, we do inevitably want to turn to something to, or to someone to help us through these worries. And the interesting thing about this global survey is this particular question. Generally speaking, would you say things in this country are heading in the right direction or are they off on the wrong track? And what we find is that nearly two-thirds of people who respond to the survey are saying that their country is on the wrong track. That indicates that there is a massive lack of confidence in human governments of being able to be capable of solving their own problems. You see, humanity has been trying for thousands of years to bring about some sort of worry-free future. But instead, it reels to and fro from one humanitarian crisis to the next. Whether it's world wars, stock market crashes, terrorist attacks, environmental disasters, or even the current global pandemic, we can see that we are living in a very fragile world. There are no easy answers that the governments are able to provide to these major issues that are worrying people. And so tonight, 
we want to have a look at what the Bible has to say in relation to these top issues which are worrying Australians and people around the world. And what we like to show you is that the Bible reveals a wonderful plan for humanity. It talks about a time when God will send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will send his son to the earth to establish a wonderful kingdom that will last for a thousand years. And during this period of time, there will be a time of prosperity that the world has never experienced before. And so, under the rulership of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will be assisted by immortal saints, there will be a worldwide education campaign that will teach people to live godly lives while at the same time restoring the natural beauty of the earth. And so what we're describing is a remarkable transformational change that will take place. It will be transformational mentally, morally and physically. But more importantly, it's a transformational time that you can also be a part of as well. And we'll go into more detail in relation to that towards the end of our address tonight. But in the meantime, what we'd like to do is show what is the Bible's answers to these top issues which are worrying people around the world. And as we go through this, what we'd like to bear in mind is that the severity and the frequency of these issues is very much like the birth pangs of a woman who is about to give birth. And this is the very analogy that the Bible describes to describe the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got your Bible, have a look at, come with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. And here we have the description of these birth pangs that will take place that will result in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. So in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5 and commencing from verse 1. But at the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So this particular passage is describing for us the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That particular coming is described in verse 2 as the day of the Lord. <clears throat> now, when he does appear in that day, to some he will appear as a thief in the night, in verse 2. But for others, he will come very much like in the same way that a child is born to an expecting mother who was about to give birth. And as we know, the woman will go through contraction after contraction until finally it will inevitably result in the birth of a child. And that's very much the same as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world will go through a series of contractions and they will be painful contractions and they'll be long, they'll be severe, they'll be quicker and quicker and quicker until inevitably it will result in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. So whilst we can't predict when the world's crises will come and go, when they'll recede and return, and whilst we certainly don't take any pleasure in crises that take place upon the world, we do have absolute confidence that these are signs that indicate to us that the return of Christ is on his way. These are signs that show that with his return, it will bring in and usher in a new world order that will provide lasting solutions to the top issues, in fact, to all issues which are worrying and concerning people today. Well, the first issue that um, we saw was a top concern was the coronavirus and healthcare. Now, whilst the impact of the COVID-19 virus may not be as severe in Australia as it is compared to the rest of the world, 
It is staggering to see the economic impact that it does have on the global economy. Most countries are in recession, and the hardest hit sectors are the travel, tourism, hospitality, and the retail industries. And as we know, in unprecedented modern times, the lockdowns, the social distancing, and the border closures have forced countries to impose upon themselves self-inflicted economic measures to prevent their hospital systems from being overwhelmed. And the economic, the social, and the mental impacts of the coronavirus will no doubt be felt for many years to come. Now, when the disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, what would be signs of his return? He answers that question if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Because our Lord says that there would be a number of signs that would precede his return. And in Matthew 24, and commencing at verse 7, we read these words. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So there's going to be a range of signs that will occur that will precede the return of our Lord. And one of those things in verse 7 is pestilences, or as the word means, diseases. There will be diseases that will take place. And the Lord says in verse 8 that all these are the beginning of sorrows. That word sorrows there means birth pangs. So what we could well be experiencing is that the current pandemic, global pandemic, is a massive birth pang that's taking place. And that provides us with the confidence that our Lord is on his way. And when he does return, the impact on people's health will be massive. Because if we come over to Isaiah chapter 65, what we see here is a wonderful prospect of the impact on people's health in Isaiah chapter 65 and commencing at, uh, at verse 20. This is the impact that would take place on those who live in the kingdom age under the rulership of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 65 verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. So that shows us that the quality of life that will take place in the kingdom of God is going to be hugely improved, vastly improved. People will live much longer. A child will die at only 100 years old. So the health conditions will clearly have to be significantly improved in order for people to live long lives. And that will include the eradication of diseases which currently plague us. In fact, the kingdom of God describes a time when serious health issues and conditions will be totally reversed by the healing hands of Christ and his helpers. We come over to, uh, while we're in Isaiah, to Isaiah chapter 35. And here we have a wonderful prophecy of the impact of the healing hands of our Lord and his helpers in Isaiah 35 and verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap as an heart, heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. So this describes a wonderful time when these serious health conditions will be totally reversed. Now if Christ and his, and his apostles healed many people during the times of their mortal ministries, then we can only imagine, can't we, the huge amount of healings that will take place across the world by mortalised saints as they work with all the communities of the world and they go across the world teaching the good news of the gospel. Now another top issue that was facing the world that they worried about was the economy, unemployment and the cost of living. As we saw the impact of the 
Coronavirus on the economy is clearly having an impact on people's concern for the economy, for their personal job security and for their cost of living. But even before the pandemic hit, these particular issues, as we can see in the graph, were top issues for, for many, many years, for decades. <clears throat> so I think it's fair to say then that this is one of the top issues that keeps a lot of people awake at night. How will they provide for themselves and for their family? How can they keep paying the bills? How can they keep paying the rent and paying off the mortgage? How can they save for their retirement? Can they afford a standard of, of living both now and in their retirement? These are all anxieties and worries that weigh on people's minds with all the financial responsibilities that they carry with them both now and into the future. Well, the Kingdom of God has a wonderful hope for all of these types of concerns. It shows that in the Kingdom, there will be sustainable, full employment for all of their working lives. So come over with me while we're in Isaiah to Isaiah 65. In Isaiah 65, and uh, commencing at verse 21, here we find that there is going to be full sustainable employment that will take place in the kingdom of God. So we read previously verse 20 about how long people will live in the kingdom of God. In verse 21, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect, and this is the critical phrase, mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. You see, there will be long, sustainable, full employment in the kingdom of God. They shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, it's going to be a long time because you see there the context of that phrase is that um, as the days of a tree are the days of my people. Now we know that trees can live for hundreds of years. And so this verse is telling us that there will be long-term employment opportunities that will match the length of time that people will live for. The, one of the other top issues that we saw is... Um, Poverty and social inequality, financial and political corruption, and crime and violence. Now, those particular issues are addressed for us in these uh, couple of verses that we've just read. You see, we read there that they shall build houses in verse 21 and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So that's telling us that if they're going to build houses and be able to live in them, if they're going to be able to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of it, that tells us that people will have housing and food security. They will be able to enjoy the labour of their hands. They will re um, receive the, the results and the fruits of what they have laboured to build and enjoy that. It also says here <clears throat> that they shall not build and another inhabit, and they shall not plant and another eat. And that's telling us that crime and corruption will be a thing of the past. There will be social equality. The rich and the powerful won't be able to take away from those who are poor and unable to defend themselves. It also tells us that they shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth in trouble. So people will be able to work in safety and they won't be able to work in fear of their lives. So these are the wonderful characteristics that are, are described for us in the kingdom of God that addresses these top issues that people are concerned about. There are some more comforting passages in the Bible that also show to us the peaceful impact of the rule of Christ. Come over with me to Isaiah chapter 32. In Isaiah 32, and uh, commencing at verse 16. 
This tells us the basis of why there will be uh, peaceful effects in the kingdom of God. Isaiah 32, verse 16. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So what, this, what these verses are telling us is that when there are righteous rules which are implemented in the earth, they will be felt in every part of the workforce, whether it's in remote places like in the wilderness, as we read there in verse 16, or whether it's in the busy agricultural sectors of the world, in the fruitful fields, as it says there in verse 16, the effect of righteousness will be felt all over the entire world. It will be long-lasting because it says there at the end of verse 17 that these things, quietness and assurance, will be forever. <clears throat> Come over with me also to Psalm 72. This is a, a fantastic psalm that describes and paints for us a wonderful picture of the kingdom of God. Psalm 72. It was a psalm that was written by David for his son Solomon, but very clearly it's also a messianic psalm. What we mean by that is that it's a psalm that also can be applied to the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So the psalm opens by describing our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. So the key characteristic that will be uh, described for us uh, in relation to the king's son is that of righteousness. And as we saw in Isaiah 32, that uh, we also saw there that righteousness was going to be the basis for long-lasting transformation that would take place across the earth. Now, the other thing to note in this particular psalm is the personal interest of the king to ensure that everything takes place in relation to his righteous principles. You see, as we go through this particular psalm, if you scan your eyes through it, you'll see the emphasis on the words he and his. You see, there's a, a huge personal interest by the king to make sure that everything takes place in accordance with the fundamental principle of righteousness. So how will the issues of crime and oppression and poverty and social inequality be dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's read verse 4. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They won't stand a chance under the righteous rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who oppress the poor will fill his judgments. Also in verses 12 to 14. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also in him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. See, our Lord will defend those who are suffering oppression. He will redeem them because they are very precious in his sight. Another top issue that we also saw was um, poverty. Now, this psalm also describes a wonderful time when poverty shall be a thing of the past because in verse 16 we read, There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the field of the earth. So that's describing a time when if you were to plant some corn in the most unlikely places of the earth, for example, on the top of the mountains, then they will flourish and they will bear abundant fruit. Now this is also supported for us in Amos uh, chapter 9 and at verse 13. These are, these are remarkable words in relation to how fruitful the earth will be. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper 
and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. That describes for us an incredible time of fertility upon the earth. The earth will abundantly produce fruits with such magnitude that the world has never seen before. So that when it's time to sow a crop, they're still reaping the fruit of the previous crop. And so with an abundance of food that will take place across the whole earth, the inequality of food distribution and the poverty of whole populations, as we sadly know which occurs today, will be a thing of the past. Well, let's turn our minds then to the final issue that the world is concerned about, and that is the environment. It's no surprise that if the world brings, if the world brings forth abundantly, then there must be significant changes that will need to take place to the earth to enable such fruitfulness as we have seen described for us. No doubt, our air, sea and land pollution and environmental mismanagement is holding back a lot of the Earth's full potential. In our greed for economic gain at the cost of unsustainable natural resource practices, we are plundering the Earth's resources at such an alarming rate. And even the world, as we know, understands the impact of these things on our climate. It's brought about, hasn't it, political revolutions. It's brought about a new generation of people of environmental activism who are very concerned about the impact on the Earth and they're desperate to save the planet from humanity's harmful practices. But there is one thing that we can be assured of, and that is that the earth will not be destroyed by humanity. Because you see, God has a purpose uh, with the earth. Um, let's come over to Isaiah chapter 45. <clears throat> In Isaiah 45 and verse 18, we have these very comforting words that God does have a purpose with the earth. He formed it for a particular reason. Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I the Lord, I am the Lord, and there is none else. So God himself is describing that he has created the world for a particular reason. He wants it to be inhabited, which gives us the comforting hope that the world will not be destroyed. It won't be the victim of its own destructive practices. But instead, under the rulership of our Lord Jesus Christ, the earth will flourish once again in amazing ways. There will be a complete transformation that will take place upon the earth. We can read of that in Isaiah chapter 35. If we come over to Isaiah 35, we see of this uh, amazing transformation that will take place. In verse 1, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. So there's going to be a transformation of, of the wilderness and the deserts. Uh, also in verse six, is, six and seven. Uh, then the lame man shall leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So the, the land which is maybe currently um, unable to be um, produce fruit will be completely transformed uh, through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the transformation that he will take place. Upon the, upon the earth's ground. There are similar words if we come over to Isaiah 41 and uh, commencing at verse 17. <clears throat> Isaiah 41 and verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, Yahweh, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. 
I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant to the wilderness the cedar, the shiddah tree, and the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. So we see then, don't we, that the Bible offers a wonderful hope to all the worries of the future. It has real solutions that it can be put into effect through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But can we really trust the Bible? Can it really deliver on the things that it's promised? Let's see then why we believe that the Bible can be trusted to deliver on its promises. The Bible does offer a sure hope. And this surety is based on the hope of Israel. You see, one of the clearest ways in which we can demonstrate the trustworthiness of the Bible is to consider the nation of Israel. You see, God prophesied certain things that would happen in relation to that nation, which which have come about exactly as foretold, even in our modern times. The Bible calls upon Israel themselves as a nation to be its witness as to, uh, to prove its own veracity. <clears throat> you see, we read in Isaiah 43 and at verse 10, Ye, that's the nation of Israel, are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. You see, the Bible invites us to look at the nation of Israel as evidence that he exists and to build our own personal faith on the fact that he is a God that can be trusted. And what we like to see now is that there were three major events, three key milestone events that took place in relation to the nation of Israel, which conclusively prove that the Bible can be trusted. It's It's a book which has foretold events thousands of years before they occurred, and they have been fulfilled. These three events, the first one is the scattering of the nation of Israel. That occurred in the year AD 70. It was caused by the Roman armies coming upon the land of Israel and besieging it. And the the Romans, um, through the siege of the nation of Israel, completely destroyed and scattered the nation of Israel throughout the earth. Come over with me to Luke chapter 21, which describes a prophecy by our Lord Jesus Christ himself that foretells that this would take place. In Luke chapter 21 and at verse 24. Well, for context, verse 23, he describes the siege of Jerusalem. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And so the Lord describes that the nation of Israel would be scattered throughout all of the nations of the earth. But you see, there was going to be another momentous event that was going to take place as well. You see, whilst they were going to be scattered, after 2,000 years, they were going to be regathered together as a nation. And that occurred in the year 1948, when Israel was established as a nation. That was formally declared on the 14th of May, 1948, after a United Nations resolution the previous year. And the quotation that uh, prophesied in relation to that is there on the screen in Ezekiel 34 and at verse 13. And that reads, And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. You know, it's a remarkable thing that a nation that's been scattered for 2,000 years can retain its national identity 
and it can be brought back to its own land after such a long time. What was even more remarkable is that when they did announce their independence as a nation, they were immediately attacked by all the Arab nations around them. And against overwhelming odds, they survived as they fought for their very survival as a nation. Well, the third prophecy that also came to pass in relation to the nation of Israel is that they would also have control of the city of Jerusalem. And while we're in Luke chapter 21, let's continue read, reading verse 24. After they will be led away captive, they'll be brought back into the land, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You see, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was going to be under the control of non-Jews, the Gentiles. But there was going to be a time limit as to when that would come to a, a conclusion, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. God had a time limit in terms of how long non-Jews or the Gentiles will have control over his city of Jerusalem. And that concluded in the year 1967 during the Six-Day War. You see, when the Jews declared themselves as a nation in 1948, they didn't have full control over the city of Jerusalem. That only occurred during the Six-Day War. They enlarged their borders during that war and in only a few days, and again, against overwhelming odds, they increased their territory and they had a remarkable victory, including taking control of the city of Jerusalem. So these are momentous events that have occurred in a very tiny nation. And I think you would agree with me that if only one of those events had occurred, then it would be incredible that the Bible could actually predict that that event would occur. But here we have not one, not two, but we have three events that have occurred, each event a miracle in itself against overwhelming odds. And so the odds of these things being able to naturally occur would be extremely high. But I suggest to you that it would be, in fact, impossible if it wasn't for a divine hand that was guiding each of these events for this tiny nation of Israel. So why does God have Israel as his witness? It's because Israel is his chosen people. You see, the purpose that God has with the nation of Israel is a purpose with them that will be extended to others as well, those who are non-Jews as well, those including ourselves here today. God describes the nation of Israel as the apple of his eye. We know what would happen if someone was to touch our eye, we would instinctively react. And that's exactly the same with the nation of Israel. Those who harm his people will be the recipients of God's wrath. So Israel is a very important nation to watch because they are inseparable to the purpose that God has with the earth. As we saw earlier, God does have a purpose with the earth. He won't allow it to be destroyed by human activity, but more importantly, he does have a purpose with the people that live on it. A very well-known verse to Bible students is in Numbers 14 and verse 21. And that says, But as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. What this verse is telling us is that there is a wonderful prospect in store for, for the earth. If we were to go back to the times of Moses, Moses had a very special request to ask of God. He asked him to show him his glory. Now, God responded by making his glory to pass before Moses, but at the same time, he also described to him his character. He described his character as being merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. So what that tells us then is that the promise that God has that he will fill the earth with his glory is that it will be filled with men and women that will reflect his character. 
And we can imagine what a glorious planet the earth will be when it's a place full of people who have a godly character. Immortal beings will always give praise and glory to God for the ages of eternity. And so there is a, a wonderful prospect in store for those that respond to the calling of God to be just like him. So given this wonderful prospect, there is also that comes with that a wonderful sense of peace of mind to those that look forward to this glorious time that the Bible describes. There's no need to overly worry about the future because God already has the future in his control. And more importantly, he has our involvement with that as well. There are these very comforting words in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has planned at our lives. He has got everything under his control and we can take incredible comfort in the fact that everything that occurs in our lives is for our eternal good. If we seek to obey his will and if we seek to please him in everything. Our Lord Jesus Christ confirms these words that we ought to take no concern for the future when we read in Matthew 6 verse 33 to 34 but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Make that the priority of our lives. And all these things shall be added unto you. What will be added to people? Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for, it of the, for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If we fix our minds on the kingdom of God, seek that first in his righteousness, then the glorious future of the kingdom of God will be the thing that will predominantly um, be the thing that we constantly think about all the time. <clears throat> the worries of the future will then be put into its right perspective because nothing can be compared to the glory of God that can be revealed in us. So we invite you then to reflect on what we have considered this evening <clears throat> to reflect on the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ will return and that he does bring with him a wonderful vision of the kingdom and as we wait for that time let's take comfort in these wonderful words in Romans 8 verse 18 for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Mm -hmm.